Thank you, Brother Irwin, for directing the young people there as they meet together on Wednesday nights with the Hackendorfs also. And also, Mrs. Gross, who thank you for playing the piano there. What a blessing to hear them sing that song. Uh, Here am I, Lord. And so we're going to go to the scriptures tonight. And uh, we concluded, uh, to some degree, our discussion, if you will, of uh, the church as distinct from the kingdom of God, as distinct from the family of God. And we saw what the church is, uh, doctrinally from scripture, what it is and what it ought to be. But now we're going to look at some of the things uh, in the church about what makes a, a church a church uh, week by week. What, what are the things that a church does? What are the things that a church has? Uh, what, are the, what are the different distinctives of a church? And they'll take various forms and uh, churches are involved in different things and have different focuses in different places of the world. And so what is the thing that is God's will for us to do? And then how are we going to go about those things? And so we'll look at uh, some of these uh, topics over the next couple of weeks. But let's pray as we come to it. Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you for uh, your church here. I thank you for the gifts that you've given to it. And I thank you for these young people who sung this song. I pray that you'd help each one of us to have this heart that whatever you want for us to do, that we're there to do, do it and to obey you. Help us to be faithful to you. Uh, to serve you faithfully and to say, here am I, Lord, send me. We thank you so much, Lord, for these young people, and I pray that you're working each one of their lives, and I pray that you'll do a work in our hearts this evening. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We're going to look at several scriptures because one thing that churches have that we didn't really go into is pastors. Churches have pastors, of which I am one, but we have, a, we have this uh, office of the church, which is the pastor or elder or bishop. So when you see that, you can see the office of the, of, the, of the church is fulfilled by one of these words, which are all synonyms. Uh, overseer, shepherd, under shepherd, under the Lord Jesus, a bishop, an elder, and then pastor, which would be uh, the shepherd word. Pastor, shepherd is the same thing. Uh, and so we're going to look at some of the scriptures that detail why a church needs a pastor and what a church's responsibility to its pastor is. But every church needs to have a pastor. In fact, if you go to 1 Peter 5, which we read this morning, 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter writes again to these churches in these different regions. If you consider the first few verses of the book, the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. But in chapter 5, verse 1, he says, The elders which are among you, so wherever this letter would be received, there would be elders, maybe one, maybe more than one, pastors. And he said, I'm also an elder. So Peter uh, fulfilled the office of pastor also and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. And he gave instruction to the pastors, feed the flock of God, which is among you. So sheep need a shepherd, right? If there's, not, if there's a group of sheep and they have no shepherd, then that's not a very good thing. And they're, they're left without a direction. They're left without care. They're left without somebody feeding them or shepherding them, uh, which is what he says. And feeding them isn't just the idea of uh, putting grain in your hand and giving it to a sheep. It's the idea of shepherding, the whole gamut of what goes on in shepherding. He says, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. So that's a, a duty of pastors is to take oversight of the church, to keep it organized, to keep it uh, doctrinally sound, to uh, provide leadership. And they're not to do so by constraint, not because they're made to, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, not for because they're trying to make money off of God's people, but of a ready mind. In other words, uh, it, pre prepared to do it, dedicated to it, focused on it. And he says in verse 3, neither as being lords over God's heritage, so I'm not here to be a, a despot over God's heritage. Uh, and notice whose it is. It's God's heritage, not my heritage. So let's say our church grows to 1,000 people. 1,000 people. 2,000 people. You know, got, they got these mega churches, and they have 20,000 people, you know. And uh, nobody knows the name of the church. They know the name of the pastor, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you know a church and you know the pastor's name better than the church, that's not necessarily a problem. You know, you know what I'm saying, though. Uh, are we amassing, amassing followers to ourselves? Or are this, is this the Lord's church? It's God's heritage. Uh, and he says, being in, in samples or examples, two pos is the word there, types to the Lord's church. So it is my responsibility to be a type to you, God's flock. And uh, he says, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. But we need to have pastors. Go over to uh, Acts chapter 14. Acts 14, and look at verse 23. 
Uh, here they, verse 21, when they preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned in, again to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. Here's three cities, confirming the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church, or pastors in every church, and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. So Paul, uh, under the Lord's direction as the apostle of God to these places began churches in these areas, and then he made sure that these churches had pastors. That was what they needed, and that was how God instructed them to continue. Go to Titus chapter 1. And uh, many of you already know, uh, can uh, realize where we're headed here. Titus 1, verse 5. Paul says to Titus, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders or pastors in every city as I had appointed thee. So the cities around there uh, where uh, Titus knew where Paul wanted him to go, different cities that there was churches in needed pastors. And Paul said, Titus, you need to go and help these churches get set up with pastors. They need pastors. They need elders. Uh, so he says, ordain elders in every city. Churches need pastors, and he gives the qualifications there uh, in verses 7 and 8, and then also in 1 Timothy chapter 3, you'll find a, a set of qualifications uh, for the pastor. So these churches need pastors. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse 11. The Lord gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. We'll come back to this verse, but suffice it to say for now that God uh, ordained that pastors be brought to churches for a specific purpose, and that is for the perfecting of the saints. That purpose led into another purpose, that the saints would be able to do the work of the ministry, which leads into another purpose, that the body of Christ be edified, which leads into the final purpose, we all come in the unity of the faith. Un, uh, and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, fullness of Christ that we be no not henceforth that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and by cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth and love may grow up into Him in all things which is the head, even Christ. So it is my responsibility. It is every pastor's responsibility. Uh, to be perfecting the saints or bringing the saints to maturity in the Lord so that they can uh, then do work of the ministry so that the body of Christ is edified. So if I were to uh, uh, come in here and not try to help anybody grow, uh, what would that help any of you? What would that help the body of Christ? Uh, it wouldn't. So we have to start from the, from the beginning. My job is to help you from God's word to be mature, to grow up. As you grow up, then you can do work. As you do work, you edify the body. So this is the job of the pastors, and uh, as we reproduce spiritually, we should have folks coming in who are uh, new, and they're young, and they need to be brought up. So it's a, it's a never-ending job, right? Uh, it's a never-ending job that a church has and that a pastor has to be continually growing uh, the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. All right, so we have many passages in the New Testament on with, that include pastors doing different things. I'm not going to go to all of them. Uh, I'm going to uh, keep it brief tonight. But the Lord Jesus was the first pastor of the first church. He had his little flock there, a small flock that he shepherded. And the Lord Jesus is the chief shepherd. Uh, when, he, when, he is a, when he appears, then he'll, in fact, we can look at that in Peter. First uh, Peter chapter 5, verse 4. When the chief shepherd shall appear... Ye, that is, the pastors, shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away when the chief shepherd. So I'm not the chief shepherd, so I'm a small s shepherd, and uh, I'm an under shepherd. So all I do is uh, I'm one of the, the shepherd's helpers, okay? So I have responsibilities. I have responsibilities of oversight. I have responsibilities of caring, but I'm not your Lord. There's only one Lord, and so keep that in mind. But also keep in mind that I stand in a place uh, that he has designated to the church. Not for me, but the office's sake. Right. Okay? For the office's sake. Go to um, uh, some other passages uh, regarding our responsibilities in the church. Go to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. 
And I didn't plan it this way, but it lines up with the uh, message this morning on submission. We actually had this verse in there, but Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, I, I, I believe it was Paul here, said, Obey them that have the rule over you. So pastors do have the rule. They have the rule over you. And he says, Obey and submit yourselves. So that's your responsibility to the pastor. Not, not, it, it wouldn't matter if it was me, it could be some other pastor. So don't think that I'm trying to lord it over you because I don't, for my sake, uh, when somebody says yes sir to me and does what I tell them to do, that's, that feels odd to me. Uh, who am I to be instructing other people what they ought to do? And yet, that's where God has me. So I'm not saying you have to say yes sir to me, but you, you get the point. When you do what I do, <laughs> Okay, so, but, but, that's, but that's the spirit, right? That's good. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, and here's the, pur here's the purpose for that, for they watch for your souls. So we talked about the battle for the, battle for the soul this morning. It is my responsibility to look after your souls. And I look after your souls individually, and I watch for the soul of the church. And so it's my responsibility to do that, and so it's your responsibility to, sub to submit yourself to that because that's what I'm doing. So not only it is what is my responsibility, it's what I am doing. So how is it when, it, when, it, when a sheep says to the shepherd, no, I'm going to go off this way, I'm going to go off the path, I'm going to go this way. What does the shepherd have to do? He has to go get him. Why does he bother going to get him? Because he's watching for him. He's watching for that sheep. And when the sheep goes astray, he's got to go get him. And the sheep doesn't like it. The sheep's trying to go the opposite way. No, it's his responsibility to watch for the souls. And so it would be better for the sheep if they didn't veer off the path, right? If they stayed on the path. Uh, that the shepherd has set. They watch for your souls as they that must give account. Now remember this, the pastor is going to give account for how he's shepherded. Sometimes people say, well, uh, I don't really like the way he's shepherding and so I'm going to go off. Well, you're being like the disobedient sheep. All right? The pastor is the one who's going to give account. He will give account to the Lord for how he shepherds. Now I'm not saying if the shepherd is, in, is uh, doing something grossly wrong that you don't uh, leave the church or try to deal with it. Okay, obviously. But on general things, you need to show the shepherd of whatever church that you belong to. In this case, I think everybody basically belongs to this church. Uh, you need to show me some deference. Show the pastor some, some deference. Okay? He might not have done it the way you would have done it. That's okay. He'll give account for how he did it. Sure. All right? Now, if he's preaching false doctrine, saying you can work your way to heaven, or uh, denying the Trinity, or some such thing, deal with it. If he's covering up some gross immorality, deal with it. All right, but if he just, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, I don't know, uh, pick something random. All right, show some deference to the pastor. And you say, well, Pastor Stockton, you've only been here less than six months. That's true, less than six months. Can you believe that? Yeah. And uh, so we don't know you. Well, I understand that, but uh, you know, we gotta, we have to grow into each other in that way. I'm talking about us specifically, our church, not just every church. But this is, the, this, is the, uh, this is the stipulation. He doesn't say, if he's only been there five months, then you don't have to show him deference. So keep that in mind, okay? All right, we, com we come to uh, the next part. He says, they, mu they that must give account that they, must do that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So the accounting is not only about how I pastor, but about how you are as a sheep. That's what I'm going to tell the Lord. What kind of sheep are you? What kind of church member am I? That's a heavy thing for me to think about in the past. You know, what, how, what, what kind of a church member was I? What kind of attitude did I have toward the preaching of God's word and toward the instruction of my pastor and toward his leadership? Uh, what, what account can he give of me? Is he going to be able to do it with joy and say that that church member was so supportive of the work of God, that person was faithful, that person engendered peace in the body, that person was uh, quick to forgive. That person was quick to uh, 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 right wrongs. That person was quick to do these things. Or am I going to have to give it a, a, an account of grief? You know what? They caused me a lot of grief. They caused the church a lot of trouble. Am I going to have to do that? I pray not. Because that is unprofitable for you or detrimental to you. Say, so in what way is that? I don't know. The Lord knows that. But that's what the Lord says. He says that is unprofitable for you. So it is my job to watch and 
uh, for your souls, to be alert. And so I'm trying to do that in the strength of the Lord, to be uh, uh, focused on that. And that's my responsibility. And then your responsibility is to follow in that. All right, we go to uh, Ephesians chapter 4. We already saw, but go to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. And in Acts 20, if you look at verse 17, Paul had called uh, the elders of the church at Ephesus to Miletus. So Ephesus had more than one pastor. Uh, and he called them to the city of Miletus where he was. And he gave some instruction to them in verse 28. He said, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. So the church of God is an important thing. It is God's entity for worship and spiritual growth in the New Testament. And it's that which he has purchased with his own blood. But he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed. So there's that shepherding idea again. The flock of sheep and the word for feed is where we get our word uh, pastor from. Uh, and this is what we ought to be doing. Take heed Therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock of which the Holy Ghost, ha Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. One of the best books I ever read as a, as a um, young preacher was called The Reformed Pastor by a man named Richard Baxter. And in that, he has a whole chapter called Take Heed Unto Thyself. Uh, it might be more than one chapter, but it's a whole length of the book is Take Heed Unto Thyself. And that, that smote me as a young pastor to read that and to be challenged. I need to be taking heed to myself and focus on my spiritual walk with the Lord if I don't have a spiritual walk with the Lord, how can I try to help anybody else? And so that was a good challenge for me. And if you ever go to hold of it, it would be good, uh, just for any of you men, it would be good, or women, it would be, be a good thing to, to read. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves, but also to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. So it's my responsibility to watch and take heed uh, to all of you. And that's a difficult thing. The more of you that there are, the more difficult it is. Uh, it's not easy. And, and uh, each person's problem is the biggest problem. You know what I mean? Uh, our problem, the one that we have, is the most major thing. But there's 60 problems out there because there's 60 members. You know, there's 100 problems because there's 100 members. And so these are uh, uh, things that we need to remember. Uh, not every problem gets dealt with on, on a Monday. Sometimes it takes 10 Mondays or a year of Mondays, right? Sometimes certain people need to be encouraged to, to grow through something right. over a length of time. Other things you have to say right now, hey, this needs to be dealt with right now. Sometimes you give people space and you just show them mercy and you love them and you encourage them and say, it's okay, the Lord is helping you. And then other times you have to say, hey, you know what? I've helped you enough here. I've encouraged you enough. You need to do this. I need to do it now. Okay? There's all these different things, and I've had to learn these things. I, I used to be always the do-it-now guy. Uh, always. And the Lord had to teach me and humble me and make me realize you need to be a little bit more merciful here and you need to realize that this takes time and I'm doing a work in their heart and you can't require it of them. You're not God. And God taught me that by mistakes that I made and also by a uh, great and, and uh, good model uh, uh, examples that I had in my life. So I praise God for those things. I'm still learning those things. So I say I learned them. I'm still learning. But uh, these, are, these are the things that God has worked in my life. Go to uh, uh, Acts 15. Acts 15, you have kind of a whole council happening. And Peter's kind of giving a report and exp ex explanation. And he has the floor. But then when you come to chapter 15, verse 13, so you have Peter and uh, Paul and Barnabas all declaring how the Lord is working among the Gentiles. And they're having this council to figure out what to do. But when you come to verse 13, James, who's the pastor at Jerusalem at this time, he stands up, and what happens? He says, uh, what happens? Everybody holds their peace. And James answered, saying, men and brethren, hearken unto me. In other words, now everybody's had their, you know, their statement to make, but now I'm going to make the ruling. The pastor's going to stand up, and he's going to be the one who makes the ruling. And he he, he uh, makes the ruling. And then you come down to verse 19. He says, Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble them not, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. All right? So the, the different 
entities had their say in support of whatever. We had Peter and Paul and Barnabas having a, a say in support of the uh, Lord's working in the hearts of the Gentiles. But then James, who's the pastor of the church, gets up and he makes the ruling. And then he gives his sentence. Everybody pays attention to him, everybody listens to him, and then he makes his sentence, and that sentence was binding. You say, well, pastor, didn't they vote? I don't know if they voted or not. See, God's churches are to be pastor-led. They are to be pastor-led. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm going to ramrod through everything, every little piece of agenda. But it does mean that I'm going to set the course, and that I'm going to set the pace, and that the church needs to assent to that. Now, uh, again, we have uh, a voting process, and we have all these things. We have our constitution, and we set up the order. But churches are to be pastor-led and pastor overseen. And so we'll operate that way. Okay, we come down to um, uh, 2 Corinthians 16. Can't be 2 Corinthians 16. Maybe 1 Corinthians 16 is what I'm looking for. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 16. This one, I don't know if this was a pastor or not, but it, it, uh, it seems like it. If you come to, uh, this has been the theme verse on our bulletin for the last, for the month of March as we had this focus. Verse 15, I beseech you, ye know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have, quote, addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. And maybe Stephanus had a, had a uh, eldership at this church, I'm not sure. But it seems like it because he's addicted himself or set himself in the position of ministry to the saints. So he's a minister to the saints, which doesn't necessarily mean a pastor, but he's a servant to the saints, and he's set in a specific course that way. But then he says this in verse 16, that ye submit yourselves unto such and to everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth. So it seems like he had definitely a, a, uh, a ministry role in the church in some way, that he was somebody who helped and labored with Paul and his uh, evangelistic group there. But he says to them in verse 16 that you submit yourselves unto such. And so I, I make the case that whether this man was a pastor or not, those in our body who are really going the extra mile to serve the Lord, we need to have a, a focus uh, of, of uh, imitation after those people. And I'm not going to start naming people, but you can, you can think in your mind, hey, who, is the, who's the, who are the servants of the church who do the most? All right? And start thinking, how can I be like that? And how can I help ease the burden for them? They'll probably fill their, that space with something else. Uh, that's a, it's a good way to be. But I do suspect that this man, Stephanus, had a, a ministry role. And he says in verse 16, submit yourselves unto such, uh, because he's in a leadership role. And so I, and I, think an, uh, I would think an eldership uh, there. Anyway, let's go back to Ephesians 4. And we'll conclude. Ephesians 4. So it is my job as the pastor to perfect the saints. Again, I can't make you perfect as in make you sinless, but I can help you grow and become mature in your walk with Christ. Uh, just like we help raise our children, I can help raise you so that you can do work. When you're a little baby, you don't do much work, but the older you get, the more you can do. And, uh, and now my son Eli is getting old enough where I can say, hey, come help me shovel. You know? And right now he's, there's still a lot left, but he's doing a good job. And uh, there's uh, other things that I can tell him to do. Tess is starting to get old enough. I can tell her to go do something. Uh, she went this afternoon. Her mom told her to go wake up her brother from his nap. She did that, and he smacked her in the face. So I had to deal with him, OK? But she, they're getting older, and they're growing so that they can be able to accomplish things. And that's the way we are uh, in our Christian lives. We need to grow so that we can do the work of the ministry. And when we do that, we're edifying the whole body. We have purpose. We're not just aimlessly wandering in our Christian life and just existing. That's a terrible place to be when we're just existing. I just exist and I don't matter. Uh, uh, we all matter and we all have function in the body, but we've got to fulfill that function. We've got to fulfill that role so that the, edify, the body can be edified, which is both grown up spiritually mature in spiritual maturity, but also added to. And then that process can continue. We have more children to raise up. Just like we want to see our church, uh, we want to see people, young people grow up get engaged and get married like Isaiah, or yeah, like Isaiah and Vanessa, and then have children, amen? amen. And then we raise them up, right? And we keep on going. Uh, this is what we want to uh, see done in our families. It's what we want to see done in our, spiritually in our midst. But notice what he says in verse 13. 
till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's, a, that, that's, that's an amazing thing to me. How can we ever get to that place? Uh, could I, as pastor, ever help the church grow to the point where it is mature enough to be uh, uh, called, that it, to be said that it comes unto the measure of, a, of the stature of the fullness of Christ? Well, I sure can't. But if I do my part, and you do your part, and we all do our parts, and we're submitted to the Spirit of God, we're going to be growing in the way that God wants us to. And the measure that he has for us, where he says, okay, now they're to the point that I want them, we can get there. But we've all got to work together and do the part that God has for us. Notice what he says in verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro. We don't want turmoil and, and uh, the, w- the winds and the waves tossing us to and fro and children who can get pushed around, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. We need to have uh, unity, doctrinal unity and doctrinal soundness based on the word of God. But speaking the truth and love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. Remember, Christ is the head of our body, always. Not one member, not the pastor. Christ is the head of the body. It's Christ's body. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So the body... Because Christ is the head, Christ is connected to it, has Christ's power working in it. As Christ is the head and we honor Christ as the head, we can see the body increased unto the edifying of itself, building up of itself in love, because we're all submitted to the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. And so now from verses 17 down to the end, he makes it practical for us. So up until this point, it's, organizational, and up until this point, it's informational, and up to this point, it's inspirational. This is the great, we can grow up into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, unto a perfect man. This is great, we can uh, be uh, under the headship of Christ, we can uh, grow up into the increase and the edifying of, our bo- of the body uh, in love, we can grow, uh, but how are we going to do that? What type of things are we going to do, each one of us members in the church, day by day and Sunday by Sunday, what are we going to do? Starts in verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. There's that mind issue again. Don't walk in the emptiness of your mind. Don't let your mind just wander and just do whatever your mind tells you to do. We've got to have our mind corralled by the Spirit of God. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. This is what the world does. And this is how we live when we live in the old man. And God says, you have not so learned Christ. This is not the way we're to be behaving. So he shows us the opposite of how we can behave, who really is typified by that behavior and tells us that we ought not do it. Ye have not so learned Christ, verse 20. If so, be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. He says, if you're really in Christ and you're not of the world, then don't live like the world any longer. Live like Christ. And he gives us these instructions. Put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Put off the old man. Put off the old lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. I forgot to mention this verse this morning. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. The, the, the mind is the a place where we can fight off Satan's assaults. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. All right, so now we have these, these uh, that was a, a general lifestyle principle, but here we have some specific ones. The first one is in verse 25. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. It's very important for God's people that we are honest with each other, that we tell the truth that we don't have deceit with one another, that we don't say things with double meanings. It's very important that we come clean and and give each other uh, an honest uh, perception of what's going on and that we don't lie to each other. Say, Pastor, have you ever told a lie? Yes. And I hate lying, but I've told a lie. I told a lie one time. I'll tell you about it. I I don't tell it to glorify my sin, but I tell you about it to let you know how I dealt with it. Uh, There was a lady in our church down there years ago and her husband, and they were filthy people. 
and uh, their house was filthy, and they were filthy, and they were diseased. They had MRSA in their house. And this lady made, out of the goodness of her heart, a bunch of um, little things for babies, little, like small, tiny little blankets for babies, and she wanted me to give them to the newborn babies in the church. And I wasn't going to do that with those things. And so I took them from her, hoping that would be the end of it. But a couple months later, she asked me about those. And on the spot, I told her a lie. I said that we used them or something like that. I don't know what I, I don't remember exactly what I said, but it wasn't truthful. And right away, the Spirit of God told me, you can't do this. Her feelings aside, your feelings about this disease and that house aside, you cannot lie. And so about a week later, I went to her home with her husband, and I said her name, and they're both in, uh, they're both in eternity now. But I said, you know what? I told you this, and that was not true. I lied to you. Will you please forgive me? And she immediately forgave me. She immediately forgave me. Now, I'm not saying, I don't know what, what her feeling was about, because I got rid of those things that she gave me. Uh, I don't know if she, if she felt bad about that long term, but I can tell you this, she immediately forgave me. She said, I forgive you, and she never brought it up again. And I really appreciated that. To this day, I look at that and I say, that was an example of graciousness for me. She was so, uh, before the words are out of my mouth, she was ready to forgive me. Ready to forgive. And I praise God for that lady. Uh, she, uh, but, but he says, putting away lying. And I had to put away lying. I had to put it away. And the best way to put something away is to uh, confess it and forsake it in that way. Uh, sometimes we have to confess our faults one to another. Uh, and that was a direct, a, a direct untruth that I told that lady. Wherefore, uh, and that, uh, wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one, one of another. So that woman was my fellow church member. Uh, and I'm going to lie to her? I've got to tell her the truth. She was my fellow member, and so I had to get it right. He says, be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. You know, a lot, of, a lot of Christian people, a lot of people in churches get angry and they let the sun go down upon their wrath. They uh, focus on it and they stew on it and they don't get it dealt with. And we know what happens. We're giving place to the devil when that happens. Neither give place to the devil, verse 27. By letting the sun go down on our wrath, we are cracking that door open for, sa for Satan, for the devil. And Satan... When he sees that door cracked, he slams it. He pushes hard on that door. And you can put your foot in it all, the, all that you want, uh, as much as you want, but he's going to get that door open, and he's going to cause more problems. Don't give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Then in verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Uh, we, uh, we, we look at different scriptures and we even uh, consider, for instance, uh, Proverbs 31. The woman there has a law of kindness in her lips. The law of kindness. She's governed by the law of kindness. She says kind things. In other words, she says edifying things. And her life and her lips are governed by that. But many of God's people let corrupt communication proceed out of their mouths. That which is not good to the use of edifying. When that comes out of our mouths, we are tearing each other down. We are biting and devouring one another. And James said, if you bite and devour, number, and, uh, if you bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. So we, we're picking at each other all the time. Pretty much you're going to eat somebody up, and you're going to devour them. And you're going to wound them to the point of no return. They'll be killed. They'll be devoured. They'll be consumed. Let us not do that to one another. He says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Do your words minister grace unto the hearers? Do they minister gifts and good things to those who hear them? Or do they further negativity? Or do they further diminish somebody's reputation in their eyes? Do your words minister grace unto the hearers? Or the opposite? And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. When we do this, this is grieving to the Spirit of God. When we lie like I did to that lady, that grieved the Spirit of God, and I felt it right away. When we do things like this, and we have corrupt communication about one another, 
we are grieving the Holy Spirit of God. And I pray that when we do that to one another, that the Holy Spirit of God smites our hearts. And we say, I need to get this right. I need to get this right and I need to stop it. Confess and forsake. All right, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now look at verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. All bitterness, all wrath, all anger, all clamor. You can put it before all of them. All evil speaking be put away from you with all malice or ill will. So when we get bitterness, it springs up and defiles many. We have wrath, we have anger, clamor, evil speaking, all of these things, and pretty much, pretty soon we have like a witch's brew. That dark liquid bubbling, and there's some lady with a, you know, the big mole on the nose and the big crooked thing, and she's stirring it. She's going to cast a spell on somebody. What's she working? Death. But that's what we're doing when we have these things. You read that verse 31, and you don't see peace there. You see turmoil, and you see trouble, and you see something that's about to erupt like a volcano. But what's the answer? Verse 32. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Are you kind? Are you tenderhearted? Are you quick to forgive like that lady who forgave me? Christ Jesus forgave you. If he forgave you, you can forgive somebody else, trust me. If he forgave me, do I even need to forgive somebody is sometimes the question I ask uh, myself. Uh, am I even in the, in the place where I ought to be the one offering forgiveness? Uh, or do I need the forgiveness? Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Now I'm wrapping up the message here.